in chapter um, 10 11 we talked about the peripheral somatosensory system and the central somatosensory system and then in chapter 13 we talked about the motor neurons lower motor neurons which you can sort of think of as the peripheral motor system and now we're going to talk about the central motor system so there is a lot of information in chapter 14 that we are not necessarily going to cover we're going to talk about some of it but not all of it so um, stick with your learning objectives to um, figure that out um, I want you to be able to state where each of the five main types of motor tracks and they're listed there start and end and what type of information is transmitted in each tract and I want you to be able to describe the signs of motor tract lesions so um, the motor tracks are awesome because their name tells you where they go to and from so like like a corticospinal tract goes from the cerebral cortex to the spine so all of the um, motor tracts you notice end up with the word spinal, meaning they all end in the spine. That's where they synapse with the lower motor neurons, and they come from different areas of the brain. So um, that, that kind of hopefully helps simplify it a little bit. But we talked about how the peripheral information from the somatosensory come, system comes in, it goes to the spinal cord, then to the brain. The brain decides if a motor act is needed, and then it goes out through the motor tracks down to the lower motor neurons to produce a movement. Um, we also use sensory information to um, prepare for movement or to um, affect movement and correct movement while we're doing it. So feed forward refers to the anticipatory use of sensory information to prepare for movement. So that's an example of the tennis playing where you know where your arm is in space so you know how you have to move the racket in order to hit the ball. That's our feed forward, knowing where your arm is in space. The feedback refers to the use of sensory information during or after movement to make corrections either to the ongoing movement or to future movements, like the next time the ball comes over the net. So the central motor system um, is the there's um, in the brain stem and spinal cord and in the cerebellum and um, cerebral cortex. Um, so in this brain stem and spinal cord interactions among the signals from somatosensory neurons and descending motor tracts determine the output from the motor neurons to the muscles. The cerebellum and motor basal ganglia adjust activity in the descending motor tracts resulting in either excitation or inhibition of motor neurons. So the um, cerebellum and basal ganglia um, do a lot of adjusting to um, fine-tune movements basically and we're going to talk about them in the next chapters. So to get from the brain to the spinal cord um, we use motor tracks. It's another one of our vertical track systems. And the motor tracks provide all the motor signals from the brain to the spinal cord. The medial motor tracks synapse with motor neurons that innervate postural and girdle muscles. Um, and nonspecific motor tracks contribute to background levels of excitation in the cord and facilitate local reflex arcs. And then we have um, lateral motor tracks, which um, contribute to the fractionation and um, distal movements. So the postural and gross movements are controlled by the medial motor tracts. You can see in this diagram from page 261 in the book that um, those tracts are all running in the medial part of the spinal cord, the spinal column. So motor tract activity controlling posture and gross, gross movements usually occurs automatically without conscious effort. Medial activity can occur before a person is consciously aware of a stimulus. So you, a loud noise might happen behind you and your eyes and face turn toward the noise before you're even consciously aware of that auditory stimulus. So um, a lot of the information that goes on in these medial motor tracts is um, automatic. So three tracts, the reticulospinal tract, which facilitates bilateral motor neurons innervating postural and gross limb movement. Um, 
and medial and lateral vestibulospinal tracts, receiving information about head movements and gravity from the vestibular apparatus, and the medial corticospinal tract, which has a direct connection from the cerebral cortex, the motor cortex, to the spinal cord. So those are our uh, medial ones. And in that diagram on page 261, um, it shows really nicely those um, three different tracts, and they're different colors. Not in real life, but in the book they are. Um, fractionated movements and distal limb movements are controlled by lateral signals running in the lateral motor tracts. So fractionation is the ability to activate individual muscles independently of other muscles, and it's essential for normal movement of the hands. So um, without fractionation, it says that fingers and thumb would act as a single unit as they do when picking up a, a water bottle or a cylindrical object. But if you didn't um, have fractionation, you wouldn't be able to play the piano or do any of the fine motor skills that we do. Um, motor tracks that descend into the lateral spinal cord and synapse with laterally located motor neuron pools in the ventral horn. Those are the lateral corticospinal tracts. So um, there are, there's another track, the rubrospinal tract, that shows in um, the diagram here, the lateral corticospinal tracts is that big red one. Um, the other one has a small contribution to um, distal movement, but we are not going to spend a lot of time on it. We're talking mainly about the lateral corticospinal tracts. So the lateral corticospinal tract fractionates by activating inhibitory neurons to prevent unwanted muscles from contracting. The, so the lateral corticospinal tract is the most important pathway controlling voluntary movements. So the information that runs in this um, pathway is voluntary information from the primary motor cortex um, coming down to tell our muscles what to do. So the primary motor cortex is located anterior to the central sulcus in the brain in the precentral gyrus. So it's between the um, prefrontal cortex, where we make our decisions, and the, mo and the um, sensory cortex, which is just um, posterior to the central sulcus. And so it's in, that, it's in that sweet spot in the brain, getting sensory information and decision information. Um, there are two regions anterior to the primary motor cortex that are involved in preparing for movement. One of them is called the premotor area and one is called the supplementary motor area. And we will talk more about these when we're talking about the cerebral cortex later on in the quarter. So in the next section we're going to start talking about signs of motor tract lesions.